同佢去問個原因，因為其實就你睇書講咗樣，應該係 supply side 去做核心。咁但係我就希望咧，我講得具體啲嘅位啦，就可以幫你有機會攞到高分。係啊，現在呢個書咧，就係、是、基本上係咁報嘅，但係 revision manual 出咗啲題目咧，就冇可能。
actually, let's start by some housekeeping. I was just chatting with one of your classmates just now, knowing that you have a uh, assignment deadline for another course on the third uh, of January, right? Um, my original plan is that we will do the well for the finance part, which I said would be important. Um, I've planned for three lectures, so we can take it very slowly. The 3rd of January will be the third lecture of the finance part. Um, but if you have an assignment deadline, and uh, I understand that you might, you have allowance to skip a class or two, then maybe you won't uh, come here on the 3rd of January. In that case, would you want to do the third class on finance on the 5th of January instead? So that you don't have the pressure for that deadline on the 3rd of January. Because originally, my plan for the 5th of January is to talk about alternative dispute resolution, which is quite uh, relaxed. And um, I'm still thinking whether I should get you involved in trying out, uh, for instance, mediation. So what do you think? Do you have any particular views on switching the class for the 3rd and the 5th of January? Any views? It's okay. Yes. Switch? You wanna switch? Okay. Um, but in that case, then, if you're not coming on the 3rd of January, what should we do for the alternative dispute resolution? Um, because in, in court procedure, there is something similar to mediation that we would do, which I would have covered by the time either in the children class or in the finance class. Well, actually, if I switch, then okay, it's fine. Now, I will have covered the court, um, the mediation as mandated by the, by the practice direction. So there will be um, out-of-court mediation. There might be private adjudication. There is collaborative practice. So if I just lecture on these things, uh, it's all very theoretical. You won't quite understand what it means. So I was thinking whether I should get some of you involved, if you're interested and willing, to try and do some demonstration uh, of mediation in a way that you think um, works for mediation. And then we can try out a few things uh, to help you better understand the feel, the general um, atmosphere in a real mediation. So you can tell the difference between settlement and courtroom litigation. So for that, I would, I would need you to, well, some of you, I know that a lot of you are shy, <laughs> um, but I hope I can get um, a few members from this class to try to do some demonstration. So maybe I will give you a short uh, factual scenario. So you can choose to act for the husband or the wife, the mother or the father, and then see how you would present the case in a mediation setting instead of uh, in litigation. That's what I was thinking to do, because it's pretty much freestyle. You are not bound by any law. You don't have to read anything for doing that demonstration, and it could be a good refresher for the new year. <laughs> But then, uh, if you're not coming for the 3rd of January class, then we probably have difficulties doing it. So I'm opening the floor for you to consider. I heard a voice that you want to switch, because you want to focus on uh, what, is, what might be important for the exam. Certainly, you're not asked to do a demonstration <laughs> for exam. Um, OK, any other views? Anyone from the back? <laughs> well, first of all, are you interested in doing a mock mediation? 
I should ask that. I see head nodding, head nodding uh, at the back. I assume that you're shy. Okay, anyone from the left interested in doing a mock mediation? To say a few words in front of the class. And how about from, from the right? Yeah. Are you interested in doing it? Yeah. Okay. It's fine because I know that sometimes when you have a real deadline in front of you, you might just not do it in the end. Okay, I will see. Then uh, probably we will do um, the third lecture on finance on the fifth instead of the third. So we can have uh, ADR on the third. For those of you um, who came in just now, I was just saying that because I'm aware that you have a deadline for another course for the 3rd of January, which clashes with this class, so you might want to spend your time finishing that assignment instead of coming in. Um, but that class, I plan to do something uh, on finance, which might be important for your exam. That's why I was thinking of uh, swapping the class with the ADR class on the 5th of January. Okay. Um, should we start the main suit? <laughs> okay, so um, you remember in our last lecture, apart from separation and maintenance orders, we discussed at the beginning uh, what is a marriage and how to exit a marriage by way of petition for nullity. And uh, you remember we have that discussion whether we should have nullity, uh, petition for nullity or petition for divorce. And my practitioner answer to you was nullity has to be available for you to petition for first, right? Because there are certain grounds that you, you have to be able to establish one of the grounds, which are quite um, the requirements compared to the grounds for divorce, are relatively stringent. So if you can't find a ground for nullity, then simply nullity is not available to you. But as I mentioned last time, um, well, then, then divorce is the only way for you to exit that marital relationship. And as I said, and will say later in this class, um, you can have a divorce. Um, one way or another, sooner or later, it's much, much easier to satisfy uh, the ground um, and, the, and the requisite facts for petition for a divorce. Um, so in divorce, or um, in matrimonial <coughs> proceedings, in divorce proceedings, comprise of three parts. You have the divorce itself, so that's when you um, have a status of married or divorced. That's um, what we usually call the main suit. Okay, that's the divorce itself. The second part is the children part. If there are any children of the family that the court is concerned with. And the third part is the finance. Um, for finance, we have a very special term for it called ancillary relief. We'll, we'll cover it later, but um, so don't worry about it if you don't know the terms yet. But I just want to give you a, an overview. Because these things, they exist in one set of proceedings. I want you to have that framework, that basic framework first. Um, finance is called ancillary relief. So ancillary is the word for, um, like attached to something, ancillary. Relief is re award that you will get. In Chinese, it is called Fu Sok Zai Zhao. It is a very difficult term to say in Cantonese. Okay, ancillary is Fu Sok. Fu Sok, ancillary to something. Zai Zhao, relief. The reason why I want to tell you this is because um, I was also chatting to your classmate before the class that these days in a divorce, um, well, as of matters now, there is one English-speaking judge sitting in the family court. She's retiring, uh, I think, in February next year. 
And as far as I know, she's not hearing any cases anymore, meaning she's probably on leave already. So they are very unlikely that there will be foreign judges in the family court anymore. In the um, uh, this high court, in the court of first instance, the two judges who usually hear uh, family cases, uh, one is B.B. Ju, Judge B.B. Ju, and the other is Queen Yaoya. They're all Chinese. <laughs> They all speak Cantonese. But of course, in, in high court, to be more formal, sometimes um, we, we usually we do it in English. But all the cases will start in the family court. And in family court, the judges are all uh, Panti speakers. They're all Cantonese speakers. So in a upcoming case, if all the clients, all the parties, uh, the husband and wives, are Chinese and are capable of speaking and understanding Cantonese. If your lawyers, either your solicitors or your counsel, are uh, also Cantonese speakers, then in fact a lot of judges would prefer to conduct the hearings, at least orally, in uh, Cantonese. That is not because of <laughs> one country to system. It is, it is basically because um, in a family proceedings, unlike civil, uh, civil proceedings, the parties themselves, the husband and wife, the mother and father, are heavily involved. So the judges want the parties to understand what is going on. It concerns their relationship, it concerns their money, it concerns their children. They have a right to understand, they really need to know. Okay, and, and that's why <laughs> that long introduction. For you to know some basic terms in Chinese, if you know Chinese. Okay, I'll go back to that later. Okay, um, so as I said, there is the main suit, the children, and the finance. And um, usually the children part will be dealt with first before we move on to the finance. Sorry, do I need to adjust my microphone? Is it? too much noises coming through, okay? Um, usually the children would go before finance. That is because um, children's interests are always of the paramount importance. They're always the most important thing. So the court would need to be, um, in theory, in principle, the courts would need to be satisfied with children arrangement first. That's why children come first. And also the children arrangement would affect the finance arrangement because one party at least would have to pay for the maintenance of the children. That makes sense. Um, in terms of the, so how does the main suit, the divorce itself fit in with the proceedings of children and proceedings of finance? If the, finan uh, if the divorce, the main suit is not contested, if the parties are okay with a divorce itself, um, then it is just a matter of procedure that you would have to deal with with the divorce itself. So you go through the motion and the divorce, the main suit will be dealt with as some case management hearings. Um, a lot of them you don't have to actually attend anyways. Um, if it is contested, I've seen it once, and um, in that instance, I, I note that in your course manual, it says that the main suit would go before the children case, the, the children suit, right? Um, if, if you read your, if you have read your course manual, but in that case where I have actually seen a trial on the main suit, the children matter actually came before the main suit. <coughs> That's what I think would be the norm, um, because children are more important than the fights between the parents. Um, but in that particular instance, the child was having some learning issues, very serious learning issues. Um, he was attending a private school in Hong Kong and about to go to a private school in England, but he was having a great deal of learning difficulties. And he also had autism. At the time when the custody trial took place, he was almost 18. 
So in that case, there was also urgency to do the children matter first, because after children has uh, attained majority of 18, then the court can no longer have power to deal with the custody matter. And then it would be left for uh, fighting between the parents, which is undesirable. So in that particular instance, there was real urgency to deal with the children first. And for that reason, I'm not sure if the children has to go before a contested main suit or the other way around. I'm not so sure. In your course manual, it kind of indicates by the flow chart that the main suit goes first. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the case. Okay? So, have any one of you managed to read chapter five briefly? No? Um, well, you have the slides. Do you know the ground for divorce? Any volunteer to tell me? There's only one ground. Okay. Um, in Hong Kong, if you um, if you get oh, if you apply for a divorce, there are two ways for you to do it. The first. Firstly, you can petition for a divorce. So the application itself is called the petition. And when you petition for a divorce, if, well, if you are a wife, if you are the wife and you petition for divorce, the wife is called the petitioner. So the husband is called a respondent. Just some legal jargon for you to know. Because it's not an ap application, so you're not an applicant. You are technically a petitioner. It's just a matter of uh, proper expression in law. Okay. Um, the other way for a pet, uh, for a divorce for getting a divorce here it says it's by way of an application for divorce. But what it means is that um, both parties they have agreed on most of the things in the divorce. So. They have consent for a divorce already. We usually call it um, we usually call it a joint application. You you both agree to get a divorce, so you apply together. So um, the spouses, when you have a joint application, they are respectively called the first applicant and the second applicant. Just a technicality. If you petition for a divorce, then very likely, initially, you don't agree. One party wants to get a divorce, the other one probably doesn't. And that's why you commence by way of petition. But in the end, the respondent might agree, so that they will not contest it. Does it make sense? Because there is a contested main suit, there is uncontested main suit. And now I'm telling you, you have, if you don't agree, you can petition. If you agree, you can have a joint application. There are two different things. Does it make sense? So initially, if you agreed to have a divorce, you can do it by way, what well, you can do it by way of petition, you can do it by way of joint application, if you agree. But then if you change your mind, then you can continue to contest. If you agree, in, well, if you disagree uh, whether to get a divorce or not, then the only way to commence a divorce proceedings is by way of a petition, because you, you're not jointly applying for a divorce. But then in the course of dealing with the divorce itself, you can agree, and so you have an uncontested main suit. It won't go to a trial. Now, in, in practice, um, most of the time when cases come before a lawyer, it would be done by way of a petition for divorce. I think um, what usually, uh, for some people, when they have disputes, they can't handle it, and they go to, a, they go to lawyers. Um, 
and when they fight, of course, you will need to do it by way of a petition. But because of that, usually what we will deal with is petition. Because if you have agreed already, you probably don't need a lawyer. You might have done it by way of joint application. And that's why in reality, for us practitioners, we don't see a lot of joint application. We don't handle a lot of joint application. There's no point, basically. Because you, you are able to agree between yourself. That's why there is a pattern in legal practice, because we don't see it enough. We don't really know how to do it properly. Um, so that's why even when you have a consent divorce, and if one of the parties still want to have some legal advice and ask the lawyers um, to deal with the to do the papers for divorce for you, we would do it habitually by way of petition because we don't really know how to do joint application. The forms are different, the procedures are slightly different. Um, and sometimes you have requisitions from the registry saying that we missed this, we filed the wrong papers. So the traits to save the troubles, um, we usually do it by way of petition. <laughs> That's just the reality of things. Okay. So here you have the sole ground for divorce. That's question number one in your assignment. Okay, this is really easy. Don't get it wrong, there's only one ground. And you have to be able to distinguish that from the five facts. There's only one ground, not five grounds. Technically, legally speaking, there's only one ground. And that is when the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Okay, I, I hope it's all clear. There's only one ground for divorce. It is in section 11 of the Matrimonial Courses Ordinance, the MCO. Matrimonial Courses Ordinance. It's chapter 179, if you want to look it up. If you want to get a divorce by way of petition for divorce, in order to prove the only ground for divorce, which is the marriage has broken down irretrievably, you have to be able to prove one of the five facts as set out in section 11, capital A, subsection 2. So you will have adultery, unreasonable behavior, one year separation with consent, two year separation without consent, without necessarily needing a consent. And the last one is desertion. Desertion is some sort of legislative, um, or is a product of ancient legislation. It is still in the law, available in the law, Nobody will rely on it. So you have to distinguish the five facts from the sole ground for divorce. There's only one ground, and in order to prove that ground, that marriage has broken down irretrievably, you have to elect one of the facts in your petition. So, um, I'm not sure if you have a template of a petition in your course manual. Um, and I, obviously I can't show you a, a petition from my client, but uh, what you would have in a petition document is at the top you'll have the petition, and then at the second line you'll have a bracket. And usually you will put that ground, uh, the fact, that you're relying on under that bracket. So you would have, um, so I never imagine resorting to writing on the board. <laughs> teaching. 
Um, so at the top of a document, you, it would say it's a um, petition, and then there's a bracket on the second line telling you which fact uh, you're relying on. That's usually how you would draft it. Um, I can see if I can dig it out from the judiciary website. There should be a form uh, that you can find. So it's probably easier for you to understand. The five facts, um, to state it simply, is the way to prove. It's the evidence. Well, it's the way you prove it, and then you will need evidence to support the facts. For the, uh, to support the fact of, say, adultery, the facts of unreasonable behavior, to prove that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Okay, um, so let's look at these facts one by one. So if you want to rely on adultery to prove the marriage has broken down irretrievably, the requirement is that the respondent has committed adultery and the petitioner finds it intolerable to live with the respondent. And adultery means, pay attention to this, it means that the respondent has had voluntary sexual intercourse with a person of the opposite sex who is not the, the other spouse or the petitioner during the marriage. So you remember last time when we talked about the difference between nullity and divorce, um, one of the argument for electing for a divorce instead of nullity is that you don't have to tell the court that your partner didn't have sex with you. It's to pro well, it sounds like you have greater privacy for you know, uh, electing for a divorce, but in fact, if you want to rely on adultery, the threshold is really high. You have to show proof that your spouse has committed voluntary sexual intercourse with another um, non-same-sex person. It has to be voluntary, so it can't be a rape with the third party, of course. And it has to be a third party of the opposite sex. So if I allege that my husband is having adultery for proven divorce, um, it has to be my husband have, has had voluntary sex with a female if he is having um, homosexual <laughs> intercourse. Technically, it can't be satisfied. <laughs> okay. Now, sexual intercourse is not something that you can, be pro you can prove by mere allegation you have to prove that there is some penetration, of course, between a man and a woman. <laughs> and you know what penetration means, okay? Masturbation is not good enough. But on the other hand, it doesn't have to be a complete act of intercourse. So whether you finish it off, it doesn't matter. Okay, I hope I don't have to state the obvious, but the requirement is that you have to have some penetration. Okay. As you can imagine, and as I said, you can't just say it and allege it. With this requirement to prove penetration, there is a high evidential hurdle you have to overcome to be able to successfully divorce based on the fact of adultery. Now, what evidence can, what kind of evidence can you use to prove sexual intercourse, meaning some pen penetration? It can be a confession by my husband. It can be direct evidence, such as photos and videos, if you're able to obtain those things. It can be some, it can be emails, letters, messages, strongly, that, that clearly says that there is some sort of penetration in this situation. Um, 
in some course materials, it also mentioned inferences to be drawn from, uh, for instance, the re respondent's contraction of sexually transmitted disease or a the birth of a child with that third person, with that third party. But the point is you really need to have some solid evidence to prove some penetration. This is actually very difficult to do, even if you hire a private investigator, then how do you get those um, evidence of such high level of privacy? Right. There is also the second part for the facts of adultery. The petitioner must find it intolerable to live with the respondent. There is this um, six month rule that you have to be aware of uh, for this second part of the requirement. If you are the petitioner and if you have lived with your spouse, um, maybe I will just use husband and wife, it's probably easier to understand. Um, if I'm the petitioner, I've lived with my husband for over six months after I have become aware of the adultery committed by uh, my husband, then I can't rely on adultery to prove the petition. That is because I can still, I can still tolerate with my husband living together. So after I've discovered that penetration situation and I put it up and live with my husband, continue to live with my husband for over six months, then adultery is out of the window for me for petitioning for uh, a divorce. But if the uh, living together is six months or less, then that period of six months or less will be disregarded when the court determines whether I find it intolerable to live with the respondent. Um, the reason why we have the six month rule is because the law the court, um, the family law encourages reconciliation between parties. In fact, I think that's the title for that section, 15A. So it says provisions to encourage reconciliation. That's where you find all the uh, six months rule. So what it means now, so if I continue to live with my husband after I've discovered that, uh, that penetration, sexual intercourse, if that is over six months, I can't rely on adultery. But if, for instance, um, I petition, and by the time it has only been five months after I discovered it, um, then it doesn't mean that I can, toler I can tolerate it. I can still find other ways to prove that I cannot intolerate with it. Does it make sense to you? The six months for adultery is an absolute bar if you exceed six months. But if it's under six months, then the court cannot draw an adverse inference against me on the second requirement. Okay, is it clear? Um, but in reality, there aren't many problems with the six months rule. Most people won't focus on the main suit anyways. They won't, usually they won't contest it. And usually not on the six months rules anyways, if they contest it, they usually contest the facts. They would deny the sexual intercourse instead of, the, instead of raising the six months thing. But just so you know that uh, you have to be aware of it, and there is the second part in that requirement for adultery. Because it's really difficult to prove adultery, 
with that penetration thing. Um, now, what do you think is the number one reason for a divorce? <laughs> Firstly, what do you think uh, people get a divorce for? Just common sense, it's not law. It's usually an affair. Statistically, it's usually an affair. Um, so there is an incentive it, when, it, when, your, when my husband is cheating. Okay, I don't want to say it's your husband. When my husband is cheating, when, when people's husbands are cheating, their um, impulse would tell them to petition for adultery because that's what it sounds like. He's cheating. Um, but then, because you, you can't really satisfy, um, it's hard to satisfy that sexual intercourse with strong, solid evidence, um, then the petitioner is usually advised um, by practitioners, or if they go in person, they'll be told by the court that um, maybe you should consider a petition based on unreasonable behavior. Um, because for unreasonable behavior, there is no statutory requirement to prove um, sexual intercourse or penetration. It's much easier to prove that the, uh, the marriage has broken down irretrievably. And also, um, in general, it is more likely, well, it is less likely that my husband would contest it if I rely on unreasonable behavior. Because in an adultery, I have to say that you have had sexual intercourse with penetration with another woman. I have to say it. I have to prove that. My husband, he doesn't like that allegation. He doesn't like that on, uh, on his name. But for unreasonable behavior, I don't have to allege to that extent. So it is less likely that they get angry and then want to contest that. The f um, so unreasonable behavior is a um, abbreviated term that we usually use. And also, if you rely on this ground, the petition would look like petition, bracket, unreasonable behavior. But fully in statute, the ground of the fact is that the respondent has behaved in such a way that the petitioner cannot reasonably be expected to live with the respondent. So it is suitable uh, where you will find uh, physical abuse, uh, heavy drinking behavior, gambling habit, of course adultery affairs, and your partner being really hot tempered and unreasonable. There are two parts, again, with unreasonable behavior. Firstly, the respondent has behaved in such an outrageous, unreasonable way, in such a way, and then you plead all kinds of facts of the conduct or the behavior. And then, because of those things, you find it, it is unreasonable to expect that I continue to live with my husband. So if you break it down, there are actually two parts. It's not simply unreasonable behavior, okay? So don't be misled into thinking that you only have to allege unreasonable behavior. There's also a requirement that the petitioner cannot be reasonably expected to live with the respondent. So that's the original form of unreasonable behavior. And for matrimonial practitioners, we usually adopt and advise a mild or watered down version of unreasonable behavior. So we usually call it a mild UB. And for unreasonable behavior petition, we usually call it a UB petition. Just so it's easier, it's shorter. So we have a mild UB or a watered down UB. because it's even less likely that the respondent will contest it. In the might you um, be, so traditionally, let's say, let's keep the example of a husband cheating. Um, you would say that the husband 
is having an affair, something, something, whatever. And then it's all kind of, uh, I have seen a lot of what well, really detailed allegations, such as throwing a television. I remember that one. The dang, dang, go, BC gay, okay. Dang, line, BC gay. Throwing a television, uh, you can have throwing dishes, shouting, uh, all kinds of crazy things. You can be as detailed as you want. There can be, with the amount you be, uh, the petition can be as short as three pages, two to three pages, and you have large spacing for the two to three pages. But for a really outrageous, unreasonable behavior petition, if the, petition uh, if the petitioner is really, really, really angry and unhappy with the spouse, they can allege 20 pages of unreasonable, uh, unreasonable behavior because they're really angry. <laughs> but then as a practitioner, I wouldn't advise that because it attracts your spouse to contest it and then you waste your time and money and energy on fighting on these kind of things. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because you will get a divorce one way or another. Why do you want to waste the time and money? With a mild UB, what I would usually suggest is that you can just simply say that there's no longer any love and affection between the petitioner and the, and the respondent. You don't communicate together. You no longer wish to live with each other. And then you do your house chores separately. You no longer conduct your life as husband and wife. So you don't love each other anymore. You don't talk anymore. That is, in most cases, it's sufficient to prove unreasonable behavior. Because you don't love me anymore, and I can't be reasonably expected to live with you anymore. So this is very broad. And you can see this is much, much easier than petition for a nullity. Whereas with nullity, you need to prove those ground specifically. If you want to just exit a marriage, go for a UB, a mild UB. That's usually the case when you want to get a divorce. You don't love each other anymore. Okay? And you have to also be aware that even though it's called a UB, it doesn't attach any moral judgment on the unreasonable behavior per se. Um, the fact, that's why I say unreasonable behavior is also misleading. You, you have to read the full sentence for that fact. Um, it is not concerned with right or wrong, or good or bad, and being faithful, or whatever, per se. There is no moral judgment involved. Because the, the threshold is that I cannot continue, I cannot be reasonably expected to continue to be with you, basically. Okay, it's not a moral judgment. And in fact, in a divorce, the court would very rarely uh, del dwell into morality or care about right or wrong. It really doesn't uh, affect the main suit. It doesn't really affect the finance or the custody part. Okay, unless it really affects the, the, the interest or the welfare of the children. But normally, the, the court doesn't care about right or wrong. So there is also no point in pointing fingers and saying all those ugly things. It only look ugly on you. <laughs> because we have seen it a lot in petitions. Okay. There is also a six months rule uh, for the UB petition, but it is slightly different from the six months rule for adultery. So as I just mentioned, uh, usually in a UB petition, you would have a few allegations saying that the respondent has behaved in such a way, he has done this and done this and done that. So from the last instant, you have pleaded in your um, petition for a UB fact. If since that point of time, the party have lived with each other 
for a, a period of six months or less, then the period of co-living should be disregarded in determining whether the petitioner cannot be reasonably expected to live with the respondent. So if after that last uh, incident of allegation, if I continue to live with my husband, but if it's less than six months, is fine. The court can't use that and point to me and say that, so you can still live with him. The court won't do that, okay? So it's fine, it's under six months. Um, if it is longer than six months, unlike uh, the fact of adultery, it is not a bar for applying under uh, UB. Because for remember for adultery, if you continue to live together after the discovery of the adultery, then you, you can't rely on adultery as a fact to prove the divorce. But for unreasonable behavior, it's not an absolute bar, but then the court would draw adverse inference against the petitioner. And very likely, the court would find that, well, if you can continue to live together for, say, 10 months, then maybe you can still live with him. Okay, there's a difference. Okay, is it clear? Again, <laughs> the six months rule doesn't really operate in the real case. Okay, the main focus of uh, contest is not in the six months rule usually, but you have to be aware of it. Okay? And that's related to the second requirement. Reasonably be expected to live with the respondent. The third fact you can rely on is one year separation with consent. It refers to the fact that the parties to the marriage has lived apart for a continuous period of at least a year, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition, and the respondent consents to a decree of divorce. Um, for separation or the um, living apart, um, if the parties are still under the same roof, if you're still living in the same house or apartment, you can still be seen as separated. The question is whether you have conducted your lives, the husband and the wife, have conducted their life as one household, as one family, or they have conducted their lives separately as two households. So if you remember from, uh, from the last class when we talked about separation and maintenance, there is a strict requirement that you have to move out of the residence to be deemed as separated. The requirement is different here. You don't have to be in two um, apartments physically. You can still be under the same roof. That is, of course, because of the shortage of land in Hong Kong. And also, it's very expensive to rent a place or buy a place in Hong Kong. So the parties uh, would be considered to have lived apart if, for instance, they're not eating together, they're doing their laundry separately, they're not talking to each other, they're ignoring each other, and they stay in separate bedrooms. The question is whether they still conduct their life as husband and wife in one household, or they live their lives separately as two households, even if they live together in the same residential address. Okay. Now consent, it has to be a true consent, it has to be voluntary. So voluntary meaning that the respondent is capable of understanding the nature of such a divorce and he or she is not subject to any force or threats to give consent. Okay. 
and it has to be a positive consent. So it has to be, uh, well, so not objecting to a divorce is not good enough. You have to give a consent. Acquiescence is not enough. Um, and also for consent, it can actually be withdrawn before a decree NISA is being granted. And once a decree NISA is granted, the court may rescind the decree. Um, sorry, I, I should say it first. A decree, so when you get a divorce, the order of a divorce is not called an order unlike um, what you have in a criminal and civil proceeding. It's called a decree, okay? The, when you are legally divorced, the decree is called a decree absolute. It's the final order, and it's only at that point of time you are legally divorced. So before, uh, before a decree absolute, you will have a decree nisi. Nisi means um, for the time being, interim. Is temporary. So even if you have a decree nisi but not a decree absolute, you can't marry another person. Does it make sense? Because it's only when you have a decree absolute that you are legally divorced and single again. So um, once you have a decree nisi, that's the first stage of that divorce order, um, the court may rescind but usually the court will not rescind it. And the court can only rescind the decree only if the party giving the consent can prove, so that's the respondent, can prove that the petitioner has misled him, whether intentionally or un unintentionally, about any matter which the respondent has taken into account in deciding to consent to the divorce. So if, a, if I'm the respondent, if my husband wants to divorce and he tricked me into giving a consent, then uh, I can ask the court to rescind the decree nisi because I've been tricked into giving that uh, consent. I've been misled, whether my husband has done it intentionally or unintentionally. The specific wording is in the provision but because it's not um, the key, key, key thing, so I didn't put it here, you can look it up for the specific wording, okay, if you can't catch it here. The six months rules, the six months rule here is for the requirement of a continuous period of separation. Separation has to be continuous. It has to be at least a year. The six month rule is that if you have separated, um, but then you resumed living together, if that um, co-living, the resumption of co-living does not exceed um, six months, then the court will not take that into account when considering the, whether the separation is continuous. So if I resumed co-living with my husband, if that period is just, say, three months, then the separation is still treated as continuous, even though that we have resumed living together. But the clock was stop, and that period of resumed co-living does not count as part of the separation, because you need one year so if um, we resume living together for three months, that three months will be taken out of the one year. You need to be separated for another three months. And then you need to have one year in the end. Okay? Is that clear? Is it confusing? Because the six month rule is different from these facts. Uh, depends on the facts you rely on 
they're slightly different. The spirit, of course, is to encourage reconciliation, to give the parties um, another chance to reconsider whether they want to get a divorce for real. But then again, um, parties don't really care. If they have, um, if one of the parties, in reality, if one of them is determined to uh, get a divorce and they have actually petitioned for it, there's usually no return. Okay. So two year separation is where you don't have a consent. The parties to the marriage have lived apart for a continuous period of at least two years, immediately preceding the um, presentation of the petition. So the difference between this and the one year is whether you have a consent or not. If you have consent, it's quicker. You don't have to be separated for that long and then you can just go straight to a divorce. If you don't have a consent, you need to wait for two years with the separation. Um, the six month rule is the same uh, with one year separation. So if you have resumed living together for over six months in total during that two year period, um, then the six months would not count towards the two year continuous, continuous separation. You should note that, um, so two year, you don't need a consent, but the respondent may oppose the ground of a decree NISA on the ground that the dissolution of the marriage would result in grave financial or other hardship to the respondent. And in these circumstances, it would be wrong to dissolve the marriage. Um, I think the logic is this for this um, exception it's because it, with a two year it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter what the respondent thinks as long as you have gone through two years of separation continuously it doesn't matter if the respondent opposes so it's kind of unfair if you know you get a divorce and you have no say in getting a divorce so the law provides for an exception um, that the court can consider if the respondent has suffered grave financial or other hardship. And it is wrong, it's not just unfair, but wrong to um, dissolve the marriage. Um, there is a case called Julian and Julian, 1972, uh, in that case, the husband is a police officer. The wife opposed to the petition by the husband because by a divorce, she would lose her entitlement to a widow's pension under the husband's police force pension scheme. So the court in that case held that given the loss of the wife upon divorce, it would amount to grave financial hardship. So the petition was dismissed but that's 1972 in England, 50 years ago. Um, if you want a reference from Hong Kong, there is a case called Chang Pong Nang and Chang Ho Fai. The husband came to Hong Kong and he had a mistress um, in Hong Kong. And a few years later, the wife came to find him in, in Hong Kong with the child. The wife uh, has caused a lot of disturbances to the husband, so the husband petitioned for divorce. The ground, uh, the, the court found that there is a sufficient ground for divorce, but for the financial hardship caused to the wife. So um, in that case, the court's ruling is that a decree NISA would not be made absolute until the husband can provide some form of financial assistance to the wife and the child. So what this case illustrates is that um, financial hardship would not deprive you of a divorce if there is sufficient financial provision from the petitioner. 
in practice, um, it is also it's very very difficult to satisfy this requirement. Um, if you would ever, if the respondent would ever consider it, it has to be grave financial hardship. Usually, it's financial. But then, in that case, um, the respondent can actually be compensated by a order of ancillary relief. You would have the finance part in the end. So it doesn't really operate. Um, this provision doesn't really operate in reality. You would get a finance order in the end. What it would do, perhaps, um, with that allegation, perhaps it would delay the time when you would get a decree in ISI. I think um, my memory is a little bit hazy, but with that case, I told you about the wife saying that the husband refused to have sex with her. Uh, I think the wife attempted to do something like this because the husband has a new girlfriend and he was set to get married. So the husband was really anxious to get a final decree absolute in order to get married. But then the wife is not very, she's not happy with it. Even after six years of litigation in the family court, she's still not ready to let it go mentally. Um, so she's kind of, she's, she's trying to do this thing but she didn't succeed. I don't think she actually um, raised this in the court, but I think it's somewhere in correspondences between party solicitors that indicates that she wants to make that um, allegation, that argument, but she didn't in the end. Because, well, and also because the husband in that case, uh, he has a really rich family behind him. So she would be satisfied financially, eventually, by the ancillary relief. And um, um, in practice, there's this pattern we see with many, many cases. Um, cases that commenced with um, adultery or unreasonable behavior is that sometimes the respondent would be interested, for whatever reason, to contest the suit, the UB or the adultery facts, and the divorce would drag on, and on and on and on. And by the time that the court would hear the main suit, the trial on the divorce itself, then <laughs> very often the parties would have separated for two years already, okay? So if you start with a UB petition, if I start a UB petition saying that my husband has many, many girlfriends, whatever, he doesn't like that, he wants to contest that suit. And then for some reason, the proceedings take too long. And then by the time that we have fixed a date for the trial on the main suit, then probably we have separated for two years. So what I would do is that, um, um, I would ask for leave from the court to file a fresh petition based on two year separation. So you have, so you would firstly have this petition, the petition based on UB, and then after two years, two year separation is satisfied, then uh, in a hearing, a case management hearing, I would tell the court that, well, actually, we have separated for two years. I asked for your permission to file a new petition. So the old proceedings based on UB would be dismissed. And then the divorce would continue with the new petition based on two-year separation. Um, all the papers, the documents under the old proceedings will be transferred to the new proceedings under two-year separation there will be a new case number assigned to the new petition based on uh, two-year separation. So that's why if you, if you proceed to practice or if you work in law firm, that's why you would have uh, the same divorce, the same couple, but there are two proceedings up under FCMC. That's one of the reasons why. That can explain the change in the proceedings. And 
That's why you can get a divorce one way or another. Eventually you will get it. Unlike nullity. Okay. Um, desertion, as I said, is an ancient creature. It's very uncommon these days. I, I have never seen it myself. It refers to the fact that the respondent has deserted the petitioner for a continuous period of at least one year, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition. For desertion, there are five requirements. Firstly, you need to be separated. The period, secondly, has to be continuously of at least one year. The third is that you have an intention on the part of the deserting spouse of bringing cohabitation permanently to an end. Okay. The fourth requirement is without reasonable cause. And the fifth, without the consent of the party being deserted. And for desertion, uh, well, you see there's also separation for continuous period of at least a year. The six month rule is the same. So for all these, um, the last three, where you have separation requirement, the six month rule is the same, is the same rule. Um, and to prove desertion, you need to have physical separation and the intention to bring cohabitation permanently to an end must coincide with the physical separation. Have you done, uh, you haven't done crime, right? You haven't done criminal. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of like criminal, you need an act. You also need an intention at the same time, the mental element. You need that intention and you need the physical act of physical separation at the same time. And the clock will start only when both factors are present. So if you have an intention first, and then you um, physically separate, the one year clock starts to count at the separation assuming the intention continues. And on the other hand, so if you have physically separated, but when you first separated, you don't have the intention, but then as you continue to separate, you start to have that intention, then the desertion will start to count from the time when you have that intention, because that's when you have the intention and the physical separation at the same time. Okay. So the above is for a um, petition for divorce. The second way to get a divorce is joint application. And you would also need to prove the sole ground for divorce, which is the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Um, and to prove that, you need one year separation, but there is no specific requirement of consent. But then if you apply jointly, it means you consent already. So by way of doing it by, uh, well, by asking for a divorce, by joint application, uh, it is given that you have consented to a divorce. And that's why in the statute, there's no, uh, it doesn't provide for a further requirement. You need to consent because it's given, it's embedded in a joint application. And you need a signed notice from each party that indicates their intention to apply to end their marriage.
not less than one year prior to the making of the joint application. That's subsection B here. So the one-year rule in section 12 of the matrimonial courses ordinance, what it says is simply that you can't get a divorce until you're married for a year. That's simply what it means. So re remember last time, I told you that um, one of the possible scenarios you would want to get is separation maintenance order is because you're married for less than a year, so you can't divorce yet. So for the time being, if you're really desperate, you really need that money, you really need that order, you might consider it. But then time passes really fast. Okay? There is an exception if the petitioner is suffering um, exceptional hardship or there is exceptional depravity, moral corruption on the part of the respondent. But uh, the court would have to balance that with a reasonable chance of reconciliation. And the court also has to take into account the interest of uh, children of the family, if there are any. So if you want to petition when you are married for less than a year, that's the exception, where the petitioner is really suffering exceptional hardship. Or the respondent is really, 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 really bad. Exceptional depravity, moral corruption. Um, Again, I think the one-year rule is for the interest of encouraging reconciliation. So even in, um, for this exception, the court would have to balance the exceptional hardship suffered by the petitioner uh, on one hand, and the interest of any children of the family and any chance of reconciliation. Mm, this is also really exceptional. <laughs> I haven't seen it myself. Mm. We're here until 10, right? 7 to 10. Um, okay. Should I start jurisdiction now? Or do you want to have a early break? You want a break already? Okay. Uh, we come back at eight, 15 or 20 minutes. How long do you want? 15? Uh, we come back at uh, 8.35. Okay.